I know who you are, the cross of salvation was only the star, and I am chosen, free and forgiven, I have a future. And it's worth living. I was not made to be tending a grave. I was slow by pain, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. So I could I Bend me my shame when I found a grace Running my way, I know I am yours I was made for more This is a new song, let's learn and worship together I know who I am I know who you are The cross of salvation
Jesus called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more So why could I make A pain in my shame When I found of grace Running my way I know I am yours I was made for more. Amen. Give applause to Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. And you may be seated. Amen. And now the sermon. <laughs> For the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, talking about grace-filled generosity. And we're going to look at seven main passages of scriptures over the next seven weeks, including this week to talk about um, the generosity of God and how God pours out upon our lives blessings and grace and mercy and how then we are responsible for taking that grace and mercy that God's given to us and sharing it with others. And so that includes, you know, uh, spiritual blessings, financial blessings, grace-filled blessings, you know, all of that, time, energy, resources, and then we be good stewards of those things, and we give that away as we bless others. And so we begin this series today, and that generosity of God being reflected in the kind of generous lives that we live. And so we're going to look at Luke today, chapter 18, if you've got your Bibles and would like to, like to follow along this morning. Um, I think the reverb is making me sound like I'm in a tin can, so if we can take the reverb out of my, uh, my channel, that would be helpful. Thank you for that. So if you want to follow along this morning, we're going to be reading out of Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 9. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable to them. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, oh, I thank you that I'm not like other people robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. For God, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up into heaven, but rather he beat his breast, and he said, God, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, that the, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves shall be humbled, and those who humble themselves, oh, they shall be exalted. People were also bringing babies or infants to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say unto you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Lord, may you add your blessing to the reading and hearing of your word. May your truth transform us forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this passage is about who is receiving and who is not receiving the grace of God. There are two men who go up to pray. And one man receives God's grace because he empties himself. He realizes what he's lacking, and he realizes how far he is from the kingdom of God, and he is able to be filled with the grace of God. He is justified. He's made right before God, it says. But the other man is so full of himself that there is not space for even a drop of anything, including even a drop of God's grace in order to fill his heart and life because he's so full of his own self that he doesn't think he needs God's grace. This grace, however, that God gives, I want you to know, is available for both of these men. But only one is able to receive because he comes with an empty hand in order to receive what God has to offer. The other man comes with his trophies saying, look how wonderful I am. And when your hands are full of trophies, you can't receive God's grace. But grace is there for the asking. If only you humble yourself. 
This grace is for the religious and the irreligious alike. This grace is for those with power and those without status in our world. Before the cross of Jesus and eventually before the judgment seat of God, we will all stand on an even playing field. There will not be one of us lifted a little higher than the other or pushed down a little lower than the other, but all of us will stand before the throne of God and before the cross of Christ in order to receive grace and to be judged. All of us will be on a level playing field. And just because I'm a pastor does not mean that I'll be one ounce or one inch or one step above you but I will stand with you shoulder to shoulder when God asks why. Why should I let you into my kingdom? The words on my mouth will be the same on yours because of the amazing grace of your son Jesus and no other reason. All of us will stand on equal footing before the cross of Christ and the judgment seat of God. Why, by the way, Uh, we're given the same opportunity to receive grace. And it's why Luke places these two stories back to back, the story of the two men who come to pray and the story of little children who are receiving the blessing of Christ. As I shared a few weeks ago, children were to be seen and not heard. They were both liabilities because you had to feed them and care for them. They were also an asset because they worked in your field and lots of hands made light work. They were also your um, uh, retirement policy because it was hoped that they would take care of you in their old, when you got old, in your old age, they would take care of you. But they had no status in the community. They couldn't vote. They couldn't influence those with power. There was no upside to wasting your time on these children when there were other adults who need to be taught and discipled. At least that was the disciples' thinking, the apostles of Jesus. Because when they were bringing these infants and children to Jesus, they said, stop it, we've got adults who need to know the word of God. Jesus, it says, rebukes them. And he says, in the King James Version, by the way, it says, suffer the little children to come unto me. And I'm telling you, sometimes in the church, we have to suffer little children. In a sanctuary, they ought to be quiet where we can all worship and you have these kids who are, you know, romping around and making noise and they're crying and and on not so much in this floor, but in the floor across the building over there, you know, it's at an angle and every once in a while you'll hear, you know, a toy truck rolling down past people's feet, you know, all the way down. We suffer the little children. But we love our little children. I love a loud church. And I'm thankful for a loud church because that means you've got children there. And that means that they're hearing the word of God. And it means we're being discipled and that their young families are there learning how to be a young family and, and how to serve God. I love a loud church. Frankly, it's not that, that hard to suffer, frankly. It's a joy. And I'm glad they're here. But Jesus is got this story and Luke places these two stories back to back to remind us it's not about position, it's not about power, it's not about your influence in the world. Children had none of that. They were to be nurtured and cared for, yes. But when the adults come in out of the field, guess who gets to eat first? My grandmother, on occasion in the summer when we were baling hay, and I was one of the younger grandchildren. More grandchildren came later, but, but I was one of the youngest grandchildren, so I often stayed up at the house, and I helped Grandma, and I was probably more trouble than I was helped. But nevertheless, she would go out, and she had this great big bell about this big. Was a number, I think they called it a number six bell. I'm not sure, but she would go out and ring this bell to let the fellas in the field. This, by the way, was before cell phones and pagers. Now you just, you know, call them and say, come in out of the field. Then she would ring a bell and they would all come in out of the field around noontime when she had, you know, made the chicken and dumplings and the fried chicken and whatever else she had. And she would put a table outside because you didn't want those wonderful smelling fellas from the field who'd been at, you know, if you've never baled hay, it's the cleanest work you're ever going to have to do, by the way. 
And they would come in and my grandmother would remind us who, who were grandchildren who were up at the house, let, let the men eat first because they've got to get back out in the field. And they've been working all day, so they've been, you know, building up an appetite. So we want to make sure that there's enough for them. So you'll go last. And it was similar in the day of Jesus. Children were to be seen and not heard. They didn't get to eat first. It was those who were out working in the field who got to eat first. And then the children might get to eat afterwards. Just kind of the way it was. Right, wrong, or indifferent, it's the way it was. They had no status, and yet Luke places these stories together to remind us that God's grace is not just for the rich. It's not just for the powerful. It's not just for the beautiful people of the world. God's grace is for all of those who simply humble themselves and come before God, like little children, giving God thanks that you've even noticed me, God. That's what the tax collector does. He falls before he even gets through the threshold of the, the door of the temple, and he falls before God, and he says, forgive me, God. You shouldn't even pay attention to me, and yet, Lord, here I am asking for your mercy, and God pays attention. Psalm 40 tells us this. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. Ever go hiking or walking through a field after several days of rain? And if you're walking, if you don't have boots on, if you've got tennis shoes on especially, all of a sudden you're walking along and your, your shoe just disappears because it got stuck in the mud. And, and you can't get it out. And when you do finally get it out, you can hear that. So anybody here ever experienced that? And there you are hopping around on one foot, trying to not get your sock completely wet, trying to get your shoe back out. Some of us have experienced the joy of getting stuck in mud. You can't get yourself out. I went, my, my first homecoming date that I ever had, when I, I, my first car date, I was about 16 and a half years old or so, and homecoming was, I think, in October, late October, mid-October, whatever it was, and I had a date. It wasn't, it wasn't Jenny. Don't tell her. And she lived out in the country a little ways. It had rained for two days, cats and dogs. And when I pulled into their driveway, they had a gravel driveway. It was about 50 feet long and had a nice little gentle curve in it. You got to love that when you're 16 and a half First time in a car date, already nervous, I was driving the, the family Ford Maverick. Four-door, the maroon, the top of the, the um, uh, cover over the engine um, was a different color. I don't know if it gotten painted or if it just come standard on a Ford Maverick, but it had lost its shine and now was kind of a, you know, powdery looking maroon, I, ugly, right? Three on a tree, for those of you who know, three on a tree. And so I, I pick her up. She's just lovely, beautifully dressed. We're going to go. It's finally quit raining. Get her in the car, you know, tell dad I'll ha have her back, you know, as soon as the game's done, we'll, we'll be home, you know, as quickly as we can get home. That's fine. Don't speed, you know, get her safely home, get in the car. Uh, it's dark. They got, the only thing they got is a porch light. No lights on this driveway. And I decide I'm going to have to back out of here. And so I start backing up and then turn the wheel in order to turn around, not realizing just how, you know, thin this driveway was. Back in the day, we didn't have front wheel drive, all back wheel drive. Get my two back wheels off in the yard and I'm just spinning and it doesn't matter, you know, you know, first gear, reverse, first gear, reverse. I'm going nowhere. Even put the brakes on because in some cars you could put the emergency brake on and it would actually, the differential would shift to the other tire so you could get traction. Didn't work. Now I got to go knock on the door, you know. By the way, she told me uh, before I started backing up, she said, you ought to pull forward and back up. No, 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 I got this. I can handle it, right? 
telling me how to drive my car, you know. Had to go knock on the door. Dear dad comes to the door. He's just laughing. He says, you're not the first young boy who's ever gotten stuck in my driveway. I have two older daughters, by the way. And he said, I suppose you're going to need some help. I said, I, yeah. So he has to get the truck out, and he backs up, and he, he gets down on his knees, you know, in, this, in the dirt and the mud, and he hooks underneath my, my bumper, and he, and he pulls me out because I couldn't get myself out. The psalmist is saying, I was stuck in a pit of miry mud and clay. I could not get myself out. I needed help. And I knocked on the door, and the Father came to set me free. Talk about a humbling experience. God comes and sets us free. God's grace is for the humble. And if there's any prerequisite for receiving God's grace, it's humility. To be humble. To knock on the door and say, I need help. To tell your date, I'm sorry, I should have listened to you in the first place. It's fascinating to me that the psalmist doesn't tell us why the guy was in the pit of mud to begin with. Maybe he thought he knew a shortcut and he got off the main road and found himself falling into a miry pit. Maybe someone had advised him, go down the road and when you get thus far, turn right. It'll be okay. Don't worry about it. You'll make it through. And it was somebody else's fault. Maybe he thought to himself, everybody else on this trail has failed, but I will succeed where everyone else has been caught in addiction and depression and in trouble. And that's the way it always is. Somebody warns us, somebody who's been through before, somebody who's had, you know, from the school of hard knocks, our parents tell us, don't go down this path. It won't end well for you. Oh, foolishness. I can do it. Pull forward and then turn around. No, I can do it. I mean, I've got six months of experience behind the wheel. Surely I can make it where others have failed. Not so much. But it doesn't matter to God what excuse we bring. Someone else's fault. My stupid fault. I thought I could make it. God says, I don't care. All I know is you're my child and you're stuck and you're hung and I can deliver you. It doesn't matter how you got there. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are. It doesn't matter what color of skin you happen to have. It doesn't matter your social economic status. It doesn't matter how many good things you've done in your life. It doesn't matter how bad the things are that you've done in your life. God says, all I know is one of my children is stuck. And I'm going to get you out. The prerequisite is not righteous living or getting ourselves cleaned up first. It's not about getting out and trying to just push and push and push until you can't push anymore. It's all about making that one knock on the door and saying, I need help. Let your grace pour out on me. Two men stood before God that day. One so full of themselves that God couldn't possibly give him one more ounce of grace because he was so full of his own self. One knew just how far away he was from the kingdom of God. We don't know, by the way, in this parable, how many times this tax collector had fallen before God and asked for grace and mercy. All we know is when he cried out, he received it. In fact, there's another beautiful psalm that says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, for they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And every morning those graces of God are renewed again and again and again. And how thankful I am that God's grace is rich and abundant, and free for the asking. Let's pray together. 
Almighty God, I give you thanks this morning that you have offered us grace and mercy, that you've given us, Lord, an opportunity to receive your forgiveness. It's not about how righteous we are. It's not about how many good things we've done this week. It's not about trying to get our own heart and life cleaned up first before we come to you. It's about crying out to you even in the midst of the mire and the clay. God, I need your help. Lord, today there are people who need your help. Lord, for a a variety of reasons, I don't know what they all are. But God, I know you're speaking to some hearts this morning. And I know, Lord, they need to listen. They need to hear, oh God, that yes, you know right where they are. And you love them anyways. You know, oh God, that they need grace in their life. And I pray, oh God, be merciful to me and to us, sinners, in need of your mercy. In Jesus' holy name, amen. This morning, the altar is open. It's always open, by the way, if you need to come and pray. And if you just need to share with God what's on your heart, whether it be about how far away you are, or or maybe you've been walking with God hand in hand. But you just need to come and say, God, thank you. Or God, I still need your help. The altar is open this morning if you want to come and pray.
Christian artist and comedian and sang with the Gaithers. He wrote the song, Mary, Did You Know? That your baby boy would one day walk on water. And he was speaking in a church after they had sung one time. Matt Lowry says, you know what? God's grace is like a four-year-old spreading peanut butter. It gets on their hands. And the more they try to wipe it off, the more it gets on their shirt and their face and their hair and their pants and their shoes and you come in the room, it's going to get all over you too. Even when you're trying to just clean them up. He says, God's grace is like a four-year-old spreading peanut butter. It just gets everywhere. And that's a wonderful description of God's grace, the joy of the Lord. that He just spreads it all over us. I apologize if any of you are allergic to peanuts, but God's grace is like that. You know, a kid with chocolate syrup. A kid with peanut butter. Kids with cake and icing, just get it all over. And God just wants to get God's grace all over you. And all you have to do is in the room say, here I am. Lord, let your grace fall on me. I need you, God. And then just give God thanks for the forgiveness and the love and the mercy. Thank God this morning from Preston, new friend of mine right here in the front. Make sure you greet him before you leave. God's grace and mercy just pouring out on us. That, that mercy of the Lord just sticking to us all over. May God's grace now be all over you. And may that grace get transferred to others who need to know of God's mercy. In the name of Jesus. You are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, share that grace with everyone you meet. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I run to the Father, fall into grace. God with a hiding, the reason to wait. My heart need a surgeon, my soul need a friend. So I run to the fire again. Sunday church. Yes, give a plus to Jesus. Amen. Okay, see you next Sunday.